What I do is inconsequential. Why I do what I do is I get to shorten people's journeys every day. What I love about our hospitality industry is that it's our mission to make people feel cared for while on their journeys. Together, we'll explore what hospitality means in the built environment, in business, and in our daily lives. I'm Dan Ryan, and this is Defining Hospitality. Today's guest is pushing beyond the familiar to create buildings and interiors that are distinctive, imaginative, and site-specific. He's a 2022 inductee into the Interior Design Hall of Fame. He approaches design with five key elements, sustainability, technology, the client, timelessness, and innovation. His personal interior design style is more eclectic and quirky compared to his more professional style, which is more tailored and edited. He's the co-owner and co-founder of Meyer Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, Gray Davis. Welcome, Gray. Hey, Dan. Thanks for having me. No. I'm excited about uh, today's talk. Well, I think I'm more excited than you because um, all of these conversations have just been so wonderful. And I think what, what I've known forever, but this whole podcast journey has really helped me identify and connect with in a different way is that it's not just about people who are designing, building, owning, operating hotels. Hospitality touches everyone, right? It's in all of our lives. Um, but what's really cool about speaking to you today is that you guys were just inducted into the Interior Design Hall of Fame, which is like, that's a huge deal. It was a, it was a real honor. Will, Will Meyer, my business partner, and I were really honored when we got the news from Cindy Allen mm -hmm. at Interior Design. And uh, it's something that we had always kind of had on this pedestal. And uh, it was very unexpected when uh, we're actually sitting in this conference room um, when she told us, and uh, we were just blown away. And uh, they had the event um, late last year, and um, it was incredible because uh, during COVID, we weren't able to um, have them for the last few years. Yeah. And so this was the first time that everyone was able to get together and it was so great to see all of our colleagues in one space um, and just to be together as one. Well, I want to get into the surprise of that because in a way I'm actually surprised you were surprised, but I don't want to get there yet. <laughs> so what's interesting is you guys started off in residential, right? And, right? and then you've evolved and grown and grown and worked on amazing projects everywhere. But going back to what I said originally where it's wonderful talking to people who are owning, operating, designing, building hotels. I really believe, and all these conversations have helped me figure out, and or just really, I, I, not figure out, because I always knew it, but helped me kind of connect the dots in a more certain way that hospitality touches everything. And so with that lead up, you know, how do you define hospitality? It's, Dan, it's about experiences. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's storytelling. Um, you know, we feel very lucky uh, in our studio that we get to be involved in such unique projects um, all over the world. But, um, you know, there's nothing more rewarding than um, completing a project, a hotel or resort somewhere, and then seeing how people experience it and react to it. And, Sometimes it's as you had planned, and sometimes there's these unexpected moments, but it's incredibly rewarding. And I think um, what has been successful for us is, as you mentioned earlier, um, we started out doing um, high-end residential work mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> with um, a little bit of hospitality, more on one of our first projects was a, a, a nightclub um, out in Las Vegas, and, uh, and it sort of opened the floodgates. But um, I think what people appreciate in the hospitality world is that residential quality that we bring to hospitality. Um, There's certain things that, that people like, um, how they like to live, um, you want to create these spaces that are very warm 
and inviting and welcoming, but they also have to stand the test of time. Yeah. Um, at the same moment, though, they, have to, they also have to kind of wow you and create these unique experiences. So something that struck me, and I, I've heard, I read, I read that you said this, but I've also heard you say it, I've heard Will say it. Um, you love, and you just said it a few minutes ago, but as far as creating spaces are, that are welcoming, like when you think about that and you're, you're kicking off a project, how do you figure out like, based on where the project is, who all the stakeholders are, like what's your mode of thinking about how do we make this experience the most welcoming it can be? Um, I think first and foremost is probably being good listeners, listening to the client, the brand. Um, we put a lot of energy into creating a narrative that really is very site specific for that particular project. Um, we do a lot of research on the history, um, any kind of unusual characteristics, um, goals that the, the brand or the client has to achieve um, in, in um, kind of, we put that all together and that starts, that becomes our guide as we design these places. Um, and it, it keeps us um, focused. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we always, if we start to drift, we always, Will and I will always say, let's get that narrative out and let's go back and look at that narrative. And it'll usually inform us and guide us on to get us back refocused. Mm -hmm. um, so I've heard you say narrative a handful of times, storytelling. Um, oftentimes when I walk into a property, I can sense the story being told almost. It's like, it's almost like too obvious in a way. It, it's like hitting me in the face. Whereas when I've walked into projects that you've done, it's, I get it, but it's like a bit more muted and um, uh, it's more of a feeling of the story. Sure. So like, how do you guys kind of narrow that gap between, okay, here, it's in Nashville and we're going to do like belt buckles and honky talk right. and blah, blah, blah. But like, instead you're, you know, I just feel that there's a way that you guys kind of mute it. How do you do and, that in a, in a unique way? Yeah. Um, you know, our aesthetic tends to be, um, a bit more edited and modern and, um, the, the dream hotel is a great example in Nashville. Um, where, you know, you would typically think, okay, Nashville, it's country music. Um, you know, it's, it's cowboy boots and uh, cowboy hats and all of that kind of stuff. And Nashville's a very sophisticated city. Um, it's got a great music scene. And so how do we, how do we dive into that and, um, reinterpret it mm -hmm. in a way that will, will resonate with people but um, in a unique way mm -hmm. that kind of also challenges them. I think people um, want to want to be wild, and um, you know they're particularly at a hotel or resort. Um, you know you want these to be memorable experiences, and so it's our job to to do that in a way and. And you, we try to do it in a, in a subtle way, um, that's not obvious. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what a lot of our clients have appreciated. And, yeah. you know, again, it's, 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 it's approaching it in a way that, that is welcoming, but not in the obvious way. Yeah. And I love, um, obviously Las Vegas, Nashville two very like intense cities with really intense perspectives. And then you go across the Atlantic to Rome, which is like one of my favorite cities. Actually, I just started doing a 10,000 piece Lego with my son of the Coliseum. Um, oh, wow. So I'm really, I'm really excited. Oh, that's about that. cool. But <clears throat> I remember when W hotels, 
first opened in like the late '90s. It was so exciting. Um, I just it was remember. a real it was a real game changer. You oh. know, it was those were the properties, those were the hotels that you wanted to go to because they always had the coolest crowd. There was this great energy, and um, you know, they were really they were unique and and forward thinking and um, really. Uh, targeted um, a very specific demographic and and you just felt like that was the place to to be yeah and they had this idea where like anything was possible they had that whatever whenever line that, right the, everything was a WWW right. but you know getting back on that Alitalia flight to go back over to Rome <clears throat> as W's grown and then Merrick has bring, <clears throat> brought in all of these other brands you know it, they're really trying to differentiate it and I feel as if just from the things that I've read, what I've heard and what I've seen, that your W Rome project has really been almost, um, it's been a really important part of that, hey, where, where, is, where is W going? I don't think that that was intentional, but like, as, as, but, I, but they've really, but it's, people have really grabbed onto that particular project and it's like kind of bending an it, arc of a brand right now. So. That's amazing, and that doesn't happen very often. So, tell us about that. It was um, when we first, um, when they first reached out and said that they wanted us to be involved with the W Room. We were super excited, um, and um, thinking about you, you know that with Rome, there's so much history, you know, with the architecture and fashion and food in culture and there's just there's so much to to pull from there we're like this is going to be really exciting and um ownership and brand we're wanting to kind of um push the envelope and and um we felt like it was almost kind of a, a rebirth for the for the brand and um they were all very encouraging and we really spent again, developing that, that narrative and looking at um, the elements there. And one of the, the, the taglines that we came up with is live eternal. And they use that today. And, um, and, you know, and it's very different than our typically edited style when we were designing. It's two beautiful old historic buildings um, that we did this little modern gasket that connects the two. Um, <clears throat> and the interiors are more maximalism as opposed to kind of kind of more reserved and edited. And it was really exciting to to do something like that. And um, look at it in a in a different perspective and i think you know our team um here at meyer davis is really um focused on creating something that goes back to that's very site specific and not only for the w in rome w rome but also um what that experience is like um, thinking about the detailing, um, how approachable it is, um, what the, what the, uh, the elements, the living room, those kind of key areas, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the guest rooms with W Rome, the experience is more about maximalism. Mm -hmm. And from the moment you walk in the door, um, you feel that and sense that. And um, the night that they had their big opening party, um, it was packed. There were probably a thousand people. Um, they had invited about 400 and about a thousand people showed up. Um, it was a great evening. Um, and the Romans have really embraced the property. And you know, one of the things that we noticed is when we've been back there a few times is that you see them hanging out um, in the restaurants, in the in the um, 
outdoor courtyard um, in in the bar, um, and it's it's become a real social hub for Rome. Mm -hmm. And so we felt like okay, you know, it's working because we we wanted to create a place that not only visitors would go, but also the locals would go too. And so it was really um, exciting for us to to see that happening. Yeah, and. I didn't realize there were a thousand people at the party. So that actually, maybe that nerve, that goes back, that brings me back to the late 90s, early 2000s when, you know, you'd hear these stories of the W Mexico City opening and like Randy Gerber and Cindy Crawford are there and all of the uh, awesome uh, residents of Mexico City who wanted to go for the party. And I just feel like maybe that's what's so exciting about it is that it, that hotel in particular had a huge opening party. And I think that might've been a cap on maybe why that is going to, that property in particular is going to be so important as W charts its path forward. So I want to go back to, I love where you're talking about the two buildings at W Rome. Yes. Um, and again, I know we've talked about W Rome a bunch here. So I'm going to use that idea of the modern gasket that you said, bridging the two buildings together. Um, because as I, as I was watching you and listening to you share that, that kind of, that moment at the, at the project, it makes me think about Meyer Davis as a firm and your origins of residential and hospitality, your under your muted, understated, refined narrative that you guys do on the hospitality side, but then also your personal kind of, I forgot what I said, like a, a quirky, yes. um, different side. So like in all of these projects, and I guess with all designers, it's really about finding that gasket between all of the stakeholders to opening a successful hotel. And did you call that moment, but the connector between the buildings, a gasket when you were first doing it, or has it evolved into that gasket idea? And how does that apply to projects in general that you, that you work on? We, we, that's a great question. And, um, we, for Rome, it worked because there were these two separate buildings and we needed to be able to tie them together. Mm. And so there, this modern glass gasket became that element, um, that became the kind of living room, the CMB scene space. Um, but we like, um, you know, in our work, we always are focused on, um, whether we're working on a residential project and bringing in some of our knowledge from hospitality or the other way around, we're always kind of, um, feeding one from the other. And mm -hmm. I think our, our, our studio, um, you know, with, we've got just under a hundred people, um, here in New York, Miami, LA, London, um, and a few people kind of scattered across the world. But well, one um, in Nashville. And one in Nashville, yes, <laughs> yes. Most importantly, <laughs> yes. one in Nashville. Um, you know, is, is that diverse body of work. Mm. Um, you know, I think typically, firms um, are focused on one area and we really like to keep it fairly broad. And I think, um, you know, we, we learn from every project that we work on mm. and, um, you know, we always have um, members of our teams, like I'd love to work on a residential project or I'd love to work on a hospitality project. And, and we like to keep it fresh. It's almost like so, a cross training, right? You're, they get to experience both in the details and the execution of both. That's gotta be really refreshing where oftentimes people are, are pigeonholed. Exactly. And I think that's one of the things that we really strive here is, you know, uh, residential projects tend to move a bit faster. Mm -hmm. um, whereas a, a hotel or a resort takes several years. And so it's, it's nice to, to be able to switch around. Um, you know, and, and, and try, um, you know, your hand at, at different, 
different things. You know, we also were involved in a, a lot of um, restaurant work, restaurants and bars, which are great and exciting. And I think there you're able to really experiment with some design elements. Mm. Um, and then we've also, um, we've gotten very much involved with a lot of branded residences in, in really luxury condos um, recently. Mm -hmm. And we feel like, um, Will and I were talking the other day that we feel like we've really become kind of the master of these really high end, uh, branded residences, um, kind of across the world. We're working on some stuff in, in Australia, um, <clears throat> Europe, um, Latin America, the Caribbean in the U S mm -hmm. and so it's just interesting how I think with COVID, um, it's allowed people, people now realize that they can kind of work anywhere. Totally. And so it's opened up a whole new kind of, um, uh, real estate arm. Totally. So to say, um, so I know I've heard you talk about the residential side and the hospitality side, but there's another trend that I'm noticing with some of the biggest and best um, interior design firms out there of product design. Um, one of which, three people who I'm huge fan fans of are Rich, Brilliant, and Willing. And you came up, you developed a lighting line with them. I used to share an off, I used to have an office like right across from, or right, we shared a wall on Christie Street yes. when they were first starting. And they are just the coolest, those the coolest guys, I would say kids. They're, they are so awesome and and so forward looking and so strategic in how they're doing it. I'm curious, like as you're looking at product design and, and you're getting your products out there into the marketplace, let's use Rich Brilliant Willing as an example because I'm just huge fans of them. Like, there's a million lighting companies out there. Like, how did you pick them to develop this line with? Um, RBW those guys working with them was such a great experience. They're incredibly talented. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we worked on several products with them. One of them is our Hoist fixture that's been hugely successful. And, um, and, and again, it was kind of sitting down with them and, and talking to them about what they felt like was kind of missing in the market. Mm -hmm. And we talked about one of the things that we, felt like was needing. And that's how this hoist fixture came about that it allows you. How do you spell that? Hoist? Yeah. H, I'm the worst speller, H-O-I-S-T. Okay, so I will, we'll put that in the notes. Okay, good. <laughs> Great, keep going. Um, and uh, it's a, a fixture that can be hung from the ceiling, from the wall, it can be a sconce, but um, it, what it does is it's got its own clip system where you can secure it um, and it can plug directly into an outlet. So for a lot of residential project, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Mm. For hospitality, it, um, it gave you a lot of flexibility. And also we felt like it kind of, we wanted something that empowered the, the user, the designer or whoever was using it. And it's a very simple fixture, but just beautifully designed. I mean, we did hundreds of sketches mm -hmm. of it and um, you can get it in all different kind of custom, co different colors. Um, but working with them was just a, 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 a really rewarding kind of experience. And I think now they've recently relocated to a really incredible uh, facility up, I think in Kingston yep. and are just kind of killing it. Totally. With what so they're doing. To kind of flip the script a little bit, I think one of the things you said that makes you really successful is your ability to listen to all the stakeholders. So I'm really curious, like when you become the client to someone like RBW, how did they, how did, um, how did they listen to you? Right, right. Was there a similar, can you tie a thread between how they would listen to you through those hundreds of sketches to how you would listen to your clients? We, we, we sat down with them and we, they said, here's kind of what we're thinking. And they would love, Theo said, I'd love to have, you know, maybe 10 or 15 ideas mm -hmm. from you 
um, on these kind of items and things that, you know, these are things that we feel like we're missing. And so we kind of elaborated on that. And so we went away, kind of came back, collaborated and thought about it, developed it. And um, it was it was a true collaboration and um, sitting down and thinking about um, they were very much involved in how it would be made, the production cost, mm -hmm. the packaging, um, the type of, you know, it obviously it needed to be dimmable. We're very specific about our warm light, you know, getting those now the LED lights at that time were a bit brighter. And so we're like, guys, we gotta, we gotta warm this up. Mm -hmm. And, um, there was some back and forth. There were some details that we were very, uh, focused on and we had kind of some, some rounds with that. Um, but it was, it was, it was, uh, it was a true collaboration in taking things that, that we felt were important and how can we deliver it that's in an affordable way, mm -hmm. but truly unique mm -hmm. and serves a purpose. And, and just for the record, everyone, I, I have no relationship with Rich Brilliant Willing other than I'm just huge <laughs> fans of them, but like, they're just such great guys. And I'm so glad you, that you had collaborated and thank you for sharing that. We love, we love working with them yeah. and, um, you know, we would love, you know, we'd love to do more, more stuff with them. Um, a few minutes ago, you mentioned that you're the worst speller. Have you always been a bad speller? Terrible. Always. Always. Is it like reading also? I'm slightly dyslexic. Okay. I wanted to go there and... without asking you <laughs> because what's so crazy to me in all of these conversations, or not all, in many of these conversations, people that have chosen a design, a design route or a, um, a more visual career path, many, many of them, surprisingly many have some sort of dyslexia or, or, um, neurodiversity that draws them to this place where they can right. develop a, a space. Like, how did you, how did that do you, how did that mild dyslexia, if you will, shape your journey towards be, being who you are? I never really thought about it that much. Mm. Um, you know, it's just, it's just the way I, from, from a young kid, I always kind of struggled with that, but I always was very creative and um you know when i was in school people used to laugh at my spelling and you know i'd get you know was and saw backwards and you know all of those kind of things and um you know i just tried to you know move forward and it's funny that you mention it even today i had sent a a little post to somebody's birthday yesterday and of course misspelled something they're like it well at least i can spell <laughs> it's like great i never can win yeah but uh it's you know it's i it hasn't held me back and um you know it's just it's it's one of those everybody in the office knows that they need to spell check anything that gray has worked on and uh well, I, I think about it a lot because it's a theme that's come up a few times in, and thank you for sharing, like, sorry, sorry, I don't know what's in plan, <laughs> but I think what's, what's, um, inspiring, but also troublesome. It's inspiring that of the people who have shared that, you know, they found this path of design, right? Where it's really visual, visualizing spaces, being able to see things backwards, forwards, inside out. Um, and that's like a real superpower that many people right. don't have. Right. Um, but there's so many people that are out there that may be struggling with that, not really have a name for it and not even know that right. design is a path. Well, um, when we were, um, inducted into the platinum circle, um, so many awards with, How do you keep with track Stacey <laughs> Schumacher at hospitality design several years ago, we were inducted at the same time that um, Nick Jones was that started mm. Solo House. And in his speech, he said that, you know, he had similar issues. And, you know, he just, he loved um, creating these really great restaurants and, you know, what are now, you know, Soho House, which is huge. But he said he really struggled with it, but he, you know, 
in his creative field and cooking and and creating these these beautiful um, clubs, you know it, that's what really kept him going. Mm. And so I think it it for some reason it it does affect a lot of people that are in the creative world strangely. Totally. And I wish I wish there was a channel open to those kids that don't even know that yeah. this creative world is out there. And you know I get a lot of feedback all all different kinds, but a, a lot of it is from students, interns, yeah. people who are kind of starting their journey. And they're like, Oh my God, I love that they shared that because like, I knew I was on the right path. So it, thank it's you for It's just sharing. about, it's about doing what you, my father always said, he said, Gray, it's doing what you got to be happy with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they just, they were huge. My mother and father were huge supporters and said, you know, whatever we need to do to get you there, we'll, we're behind you. And I've never let it affect me and I've just always tried to stay focused on what I love doing. Well, in a way it has affected you because it drew you to what you, what you love. Right, 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 right. So back to, let's say you're in high school, right? You're, you're, you're spelling challenged, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> how did you then decide to go to Auburn? Like, how did that all happen? And how did you decide to go on that path? I had always as a child love to draw and sketch and you know and travel with our family we would go to places and I was looking at the architecture and and studying the history um and in our neighborhood in in Tennessee where in Tennessee was it uh Murfreesboro Murfreesboro okay. um is that east west middle that's middle Tennessee okay. actually it's the exact geographical center of Tennessee oh, wow. Uh, um, and, uh, you either went to Vanderbilt, University of Tennessee or Auburn. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so in our neighborhood, um, there were kids that, that went to all three of those schools. And I originally thought, well, I'll go to the University of Tennessee. They've got a great architecture school there. Um, went there and just felt like it was a little it was larger than what I was anticipating. It's huge. And, uh, and so, and do you like orange? Um, of course I do. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and my brother went to school there, mm. so there was a connection. And then, um, some neighbors of mine, um, they're all their kids went to Auburn and they said, you know, and I'd done some research and knew Auburn had a great architecture school there. And so I went down and I was like, I just felt like this is it, you know, and it was a great school, um, connected with, um, you know, students there, the professors, um, and it was just an incredible experience. And it's, you know, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of talent, uh, with the faculty there. Uh, that's just incredible and um, a lot of a lot of good kids mm. um, that we have hired have come from there and um, you know we still stay in touch with the Dean and the faculty both on the architecture and the interiors in the interior design department and they always reach out and let us know um, when they're gonna be in New York and we always get together and um, you know, we just, it's, it was, it, we, we feel like it was a, a really, I feel like it was a, a great experience mm -hmm. for me. And you and Will met there, correct? I knew Will there. I was a few years, um, older mm -hmm. than Will. Um, I was graduating and I think he was either in first or second year mm -hmm. architecture mm -hmm. there. Um, we knew who each, each other but we really got to know each other in New York um, through one of our professors there, David Brawley. And when he would be in New York, he would say, um, let's get together. Will and Gray and da David, the three of us would always get together and go out and have dinner and, and hang out together. And, and how many years working were you then? I, was, I came up here, I had never been to New York before. Um, and thought, well, that would be kind of an interesting place to live. And so bought a one-way ticket up wow. 
Um, and on my second day here, walked to an apartment on 60th and 3rd, signed a lease on that apartment and walked around the corner to work at John Saladino's office or to an interview there, my first job interview, got that. So within the second day, everything was kind of done. I had a place to live and a job. That's and unheard of. Stayed there for uh, about four years, I guess, mm -hmm. at Saladino. Great experience. My first project was working on what is now the, the Four Seasons on 57th Street. We were doing the interiors. I.M. Pei was doing the architecture. Yeah. It was mind blowing. That's an amazing bit property. It's cl still closed. It's still closed, oh, which is unfortunate. Hopefully you guys can be involved when they reopen. Well, that would be amazing. Ty, are you listening? <laughs> um, but Will and I, um, whenever David Brawley was in the city, we'd always get together. And, and one day David said, you know, the two of you should start a firm together. No way. And we had not really ever, we had never thought about it. And um, Will and I both kind of looked at each other and he's like, you know, he's right. Will was working at Walkney Siegel, very prominent, very well-respected architectural firm. And at that time I was working at Arrow with Bill Sofield and Thomas O'Brien. Mm. And, uh, and we were doing some, we just, we said, okay, let's, let's, we had a couple of residential projects and um, this, 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 club in Las Vegas. And that's what kind of launched it all. Wow. That's unbelievable. So going back to where you just, maybe at that moment where David Brawley, you're, who's your professor, professor, right? professor. Yep. Um, <clears throat> he said, you're at dinner. He's like, you know, you two should start a firm together at the, where were you eating? We were, I think we were at Raul's over here in Soho. Oh my God. So, Another kind of classic place. When I first uh, moved to New York City with my wife, um, <laughs> we lived right on Thompson, just north yes. of Prince, right next to that place. Yes. It's like such a special. It's an institution. For me. So you're, I'm like yeah. lighting up listening. So keep, so you're there. And so it's we're like there you're in a booth. Or we're, the we were sitting in a booth, and I think we were all drinking wine. Probably probably had a little too much wine, mm -hmm. and um, you know we were just we always kind of talked about design and. Um, you know, we were we were we were both working on some some. Uh, we just felt like it was getting to be. I was at a point where I felt like, okay, I needed to. What's my next move? Mm. And so, you know, when David said that, it just kind of clicked. And Will and I started talking, and we were working on a. We started working on a, a little freelance project together, and it just it was so much fun. And we're like, okay, it's, it's time. Wow. And, uh, and took that leap. So going back to Raul's at that nice little warm, cozy booth, if there was a crystal ball placed on the table and David said, I gotta meet this guy by the way. But, uh, if he said, look into this crystal ball and that crystal ball told you that you'd have a hundred employees in five different offices around the world, would you believe him? I would have said, you're absolutely crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it feels like it just happened yesterday. Yeah. Um, it's been incredibly fast and rewarding, but never would I have thought that, you know, this is where we would be today. Will and I still look at each other, you know, we, we sit across from each other. We've always sat across from us, from each other. And, uh, you know, we, I, he is the best partner and we have more fun working together and, uh, we get to travel the world and I get excited about coming into the office every day. Yeah. And in speaking to him, he says the same thing about you. I forget exactly the conversation or the question I asked him, but like, as far as maybe it was some sort of conflict resolution between the two of you, he's like, we don't, I don't think we really get into arguments and then it seemed like there was like a yin and yang kind of thing right or was, <laughs> well, he, li or was he lying we're from the south and so <laughs> we don't like confrontation yeah so we um we you know what we are very diplomatic and we try to keep the office and the studio mm. that way and um 
you know, that's important. It's important to have a, a really beautiful environment to work in and um, surrounded by really unique people. Um, our team here is um, very diverse. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, Will and I have a saying that whoever has the best idea is the idea that we run with. I remember and him saying that, yeah. We, we still live by that today. Mm. Um, so going back to that dinner with David and thinking to where you are now, <clears throat> if I were to ask, well, I'll ask you right now, it's a two-part question. Like, what are you most proud of in that time from that meeting with, with Will and David to now? And then actually answer, ask that one, answer that one first and then I'll hit you with the second one. What am I most proud of is I think the incredible team that we have um, that um, creates all of this beautiful stuff that we get to be involved with, that we get to kind of share with the world. Yeah, that's amazing. And the team is amazing. And I, I didn't realize that you had an office in London yet. I don't know how I missed that memo, but I apologize for a, not doing my homework. Yeah. So I've heard what you're so proud of your team to this point, but as you look to the future with that team and with your partner, Will, like what's exciting you most into the future, looking into the future? I, th I would say these new projects that we're currently working on mm -hmm. and um, that are, um, all of our projects are about, you know, anything that we get involved with now is about sustainability and stuff like that, but, and how we do it in a way that's, that's, that's understated, but, um, creating places that, um, inspire people and, um, make people think about where they are and what they're doing. Um, you know, we're, we're working on, uh, a huge project that's part of, uh, the Red Sea development company mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia. Is and it that big mirrored? It's the not line? the line. It is, it's, it's on the, uh, it's on the coast and, um, it's about 12 resorts, uh, on the mainland and on this, these small islands. Mm -hmm. And, um, we're working on a, a new one there that's, uh, that's, um, very light touch. Mm. It's on this small Island that's right on the point and all the, the guest rooms or the little villas are all these little tinted structures right on the coast. Um, that is going to be just remarkable. And, uh, it's, uh, they're getting ready to break ground on that and will be done probably in a couple of years. Mm. And we've been working on that for a few years, but that's very exciting because it's all about sustainability and light touch and that part of the yeah. world, the Red Sea, um, is beautiful in that coast there. And, um, those kind of things get us excited. Cool. You know, um, before you talked about that, you said the projects that you work on, and I, I wrote it down a little bit differently cause I like alliteration, but I heard you say inspire impact the projects that you like to work on you want them to inspire others to impact others and kind of having leaving them with a lasting memory and maybe changing the directory but then it was also introspection that causes them to look inward well i think you know we're when we design um not so much residential residential has a, a big impact but i think particularly in these public um in the public realm um, hotels, resorts and stuff where people are going and what that is. And, and to us, it's, it's about getting it right. Mm. And so many times when we work on places, um, it, it's really important to us. And I'll use a couple of examples is, uh, little Dick's Bay down in the British Virgin islands that we completed. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, beautiful place, 
very forward thinking that the uh, Rockefeller started about 55 years ago. And mm -hmm. it was all about sustainability, beautiful crescent shaped beach, uh, all these little bungalows right along the coast. And, um, and there was a side of people that didn't want anything changed, but there was another uh, side that they knew that they needed to um, update the, the resort. Mm -hmm. And so how do you do that in a way that doesn't alienate the people that love to go there and they have a history there, um, but at the same time, satisfying the people that have never gotten to experience a place like that. And we find that a lot of times and, and we try to do it in a sensitive kind of way. Um, and uh, that's key. Another one is a project in, um, in, in just outside of Athens, Greece, the, the Four Seasons Astere Palace. Mm. And it has a huge um, history um, with people in Europe and a lot of celebrities and um, people getting married there or special events and, and such happening. And when we were working on that, um, so many times people said, well, please don't, you know, I had a relative that got married there. Or I was at this really beautiful event with all these dignitaries and stuff. And, um, you know, and that, that, um, that weighs heavily on you. You want to get it right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you really search and constantly going back and questioning, you know, is this the right move? Is this the right move? And so when these places open and people are like, oh my God, it's even better than we would have ever imagined. Then you feel like, okay, that's a good sign. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like we, we constantly, um, think about those things and what, you know, the average person, you love it when people come in and, and look at something in a new way, um, it puts a smile on their face or, or makes them think about something, mm -hmm. um, that, that challenges them. And I think that's what design should be. Totally. I completely agree. Um, going back to when you were in high school in Middleborough, Murfrees, Murfrees, Murfreesboro, 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 right in the, it's right in the middle of Just Tennessee. say outside of Nashville. Outside of Nashville. But you said it's the geographic center. Yes. Right. <clears throat> Going back to Murfreesboro, um, let's pretend you're there, the younger version of you and the gray I'm speaking to right now walks up to the younger gray. What advice do you have for yourself? I would say follow your, your passion. Um, you know, I think at a young age, I was lucky enough to kind of always know that I enjoyed design and, and wanted to, to do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a little bit more of a struggle for me to, to get there, but, um, it was worth it. And I don't think I would change anything. Awesome. Maybe meeting Will sooner or having that dinner sooner, <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. I mean, this has just been such an incredible conversation for me just to learn about you and your journey a little bit more. Um, and I thank you for your time. If people wanted to learn more about you or Meyer Davis, like how can they get in touch? They should, um, um they should go to our, our website, which is MeyerDavis.com. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if, if we're happy to, to, uh, we always have young kids coming through and talking to them. And, um, you know, if there's somebody that's getting ready to graduate and is interested in residential design or hospitality design, get in touch with us. We'd love to talk to you. Buy that one way ticket to New York and try to find a job and an apartment in three days or two days. Was it two days? Uh, two days. That's yeah, right. That's crazy. That's right. Wow. Um, so I just want to say thank you for your time. I know how busy you are with your hundred employees and all of your offices all over the world. Thank you. Dan, thank you. This has really been a pleasure and, yeah. uh, and really enjoyed it. Yes. Um, and to you guys, the listeners, thank you without you. Um, 
tuning in and the audience growing every week, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. And if this has changed your idea on how to design or deliver hospitality, please pass it along because we've all grown by word of mouth. So thank you very much and we'll catch you next time.